We are glad you're with us this morning. We're going to be, as I said, in Luke chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in your Bibles there in the pews, third book in chapter 10, and uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version, and or, or you have the New International Version here, brother. I will be reading from the New Living Translation here in just a moment, and as I said, bear with us because we're going to be talking about a lot of detail as we begin when we talk, start to talk about distraction. Let's pray. Father, thanks again for the opportunity to look into your word. We pray as always that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength and our redeemer. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes distractions are funny and they're embarrassing. Nothing like being embarrassed in your neighborhood when you're the pastor right down from the church. And it happened to me just a few weeks ago. I was... I had, a, I, would, I had a low tire, something was going on. Uh, this was before the wedding, and so I took my car down to the gas station down the street, saw that they had a place to get air. So I thought, all right. So as I, as I knew, it was like the back tire on the passenger side. So the way I pulled in, I thought, I'm gonna be far away. So as I did, I turned in like this and went to back up, and guess what? Somebody else was trying to get in in front of me. You ever had that happen? You know, you're going to the gas thing and you're like, oh, not today. Not going to happen today. No, no, no. So I, I started to back up. And, I, and so I'm backing up and the person's going like this. And I'm like, not on your life. I'm not letting you get in front of me. And I'm backing up and I'm watching them go like this. All of a sudden I feel, boom. And I looked at my backup camera. And I was sitting right against the pole to keep me from hitting the, uh, the actual vacuum, and I went, now, at that point, I thought, okay, that, that was stupid, and then I realized the person that was waving was telling me, hey, you idiot, I'm not trying to get in front of you, you're going to hit the pole, and I had a backup camera, so I did what any normal human being embarrassed at that moment would have done, I got out of the car, didn't look at the person, filled up the air, pulled up, and then I went back around, and I told the gas station attendant, I said, hey, dude, Listen, um, I just backed into your pole. He said, did you leave paint on it? And I said, I don't think that's all right. I'll just repaint it. Did you hurt your car? I go, no. And I said, and what's worse, I got to have a backup camera. And he goes, all right, well, you have a good day. <laughs> and I thought, how, and you think, how dumb can this be? Like I could have had an excuse that I didn't have a backup camera, but I had a backup camera, but I was so distracted by thinking that this person was going to get in front of me that I wound up hitting that thing. Well, distractions are humorous sometimes. I'm sure you have stories of distractions. Maybe when you walked into something, you walked into the wrong restroom. God knows I've done that one too. You've been distracted and not watching what you're doing, like my friend who had, he, he had just gotten cash. He was eating lunch. He was going out of town. So he had a couple of hundred dollar bills on him for vacation. And so all of a sudden, I wasn't there, but as he, he was going through to leave the waitress a $10 tip, he, he, later on as he got away, he said to his wife, he goes, I'm missing $100. Then he realized he gave it to the server. Now, obviously, you can't go to the server. Hey, remember the $100 tip I gave you? I need 90 bucks back. So we just kind of left it alone. He said, you should have seen when I walked in there the next time. She was, she was rolling out the red carpet for me because I gave her a $100 tip. And he said, I thought, not again. That was an accident. But he was distracted by what he was doing. And he left her a $100 tip as opposed to a $10 bill. We've all been distracted at times. Sometimes, sometimes it's not so funny. Sometimes it drives us to weird places. And the funny thing is, is, is when we talk, and we'll talk about some of this internet stuff in just a little bit and social media and all of that, we, we somehow think that distraction's a new thing. Aldous Huxley in the 1950s wrote of man's almost infinite appetite for distraction. 1950. He talked about, he wrote about man's infinite appetite for distraction. And it's just continued. Tristan Harris, who you may hear me talk about, who was part of a, of a, of a, a movie called The Social Dilemma. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It'll, 
It'll get your attention about what's going on in technology. He worked for one of the big technology companies, and now he's gone away to form a, a not-for-profit organization that will, with the idea of which is going to hold them accountable and help make them be more responsible. This is what he said about what's happening now in tech. He says that that things are being intentionally, they're intentionally being designed for distraction and addiction. Our smartphones, technology, are intentionally being designed for distraction and then addiction. There's a, a Medium article. Now, this one i got to put my glasses on for. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to read you all of this or even as much as I did at 945. But this is just a work stuff. This uh, research was done in a typical office where you can't focus on a task at hand for more than X amount of minutes. What do you think it is? You can you, you just yell it out. How many minutes? Huh? Three? Anybody else? Five? Anybody else? Two? Okay. Now it says a typical officer can't focus on a task at hand for more than 11 continuous minutes. Now, here's the other thing. If you're a typical internet user, your online screen focus lasts a mere, how many seconds do you think on average? If you're a typical internet user. Go ahead. Online. Online, online screen focus lasts how long? Two. Two seconds? Two no, 40 seconds. 40 seconds. So you think about that and uh, listen at this. Now, by the way, when you're distracted and you get interrupted, how many minutes do you think it takes your brain to go to get back on track? 30. 30 anybody else? 40? 25. 25 minutes. That's why when somebody interrupts you, you're like, whole thing's done. You know, that's it. And, it, and we think about our whole day is, is, is caught up with interruptions and distractions and all of that. So there's, there's more. There's money about how much this is costing us. By the way, guess how many, what percentage of accidents on the road are caused by every year by distracted driving? What percentage? 100%. Not 100, 90, 64, 64, 64%. Um, the, the thing is, is that distractions become uh, addictive. Listen at this, online advertising, <laughs> I hate online advertising. Don't you hate those pop-ups? You're like, and you try to get rid of them, and then like five more pop up. 61% of people say they don't want to be distracted by online ads. 91% of people say that today's online ads are more intrusive, more intrusive compared to email, compared to a few years ago. Average office worker checks their inbox, how many times do you think per hour? Five. Five per hour? Ten. Ten? Nope. Try this. 36 times per hour. And you think about when you have your, your phone, whoosh, whoosh, refresh, whoosh, refresh, 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 and on and on it goes. There is so many things that are causing us distraction, but there's more than that. There are other things that are causing distraction. Forget, forget our smartphones and forget all of that. Get this. Oh, uh, when, you, when you look at it, by, by the way, l let me just say this real quick. We think we can multitask. Do you know that's a myth, right? People say, I'm the king of multitasking. I'm the queen of multitasking. Your brain can really only focus on one thing at a time. What's interesting is that people, when they, when, when, when they think they're multitasking, our brains are moving so fast. We think we're multitasking, but we're not. We're literally only able to focus on one thing at a time. So it's interesting to note, though, there are a couple of other things that distract us, and I want to give them to you for a few minutes. And these maybe are a little more, well, sinister, a little more operating in the background. Here they are. The first one that causes a lot of distraction is our own ego. I want you to think about that for a moment. You know, we all have voices in our heads, right? If you don't, listen, you got them. It's, and sometimes it's one voice or it's many voices, and if you kind of combine them, and they're, they're the voices that tell you you're not good enough, you can't do this, you'll never be enough. It's maybe it was the voices of a parent or a bully or somebody else, but we hear them coming in. It's the voice if you've ever taken a public speaking class and you're thinking to yourself, you're so nervous because you're saying, everybody's going to look at me, and what if I say something wrong, and what if I'm stupid? We go into a job interview. What if I blow it? What if I say? And we get so caught up in us that we're distracted from doing what we really need to be doing. Fulfilling our ego can become 
a distraction itself because we're focused on the inside and not the outside. There's another thing, of course, that I think is when we, when we understand it, that ego is bad, but also substances. Let's talk about them for a second. We say, well, if I, I just got to have a drink just to calm me down. If you have a drink just to calm you down, it's easier to take another drink just to calm you down or to take one more of those prescription medications that they told you not to take. They said, this is what you should take. And you take one more and one more because of how it's making you feeling. And the next thing you know, you're, it, all of these substances are a distraction and you're trying to distract from the pain that's telling you there's something wrong. There's, it's distracting you from what you really need to be thinking about. And so we'll eat and we'll drink and we'll do all of those things to avoid something else. You know what else is distracts us? Activity. Entire books have been written now about hurry and about busyness. We now, when the busier somebody is and the more we're doing, we clap for them. The problem is, is that often busyness and workaholism is being done to avoid actually dealing with the bigger questions of life. And we just tell people, I'm just too busy. And we move it at such a fast pace that we never slow down. Here's what's interesting about Jesus. Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus spent more time in silence than he did with the crowds. Jesus spent more time at rest than he did serving the multitude of crowds. So we get addicted and distracted and then addicted to the busyness. And then when it's gone, we don't know what to do with it. We are living distracted. And you know what happens when we get distracted and we drink more, we add it to the baggage. We eat more, we add it to the baggage. We keep adding more and more stuff to the baggage. What do we do with it? How do we stop being driven by distraction and be, be driven by the right things? Well, we're going to look at a story today, and one that, to me, is, is quite interesting. It's found in Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to give you the situation as to what's going on there. And there's, some, there's some interesting context that I don't think that maybe I myself didn't even notice before this story uh, in, in, in times past. It's in Luke chapter 10 that contains one of the most famous stories of Jesus' ministry. The story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. You know, you, know, you know how the whole thing happens and what happens. But have you ever thought about this? That, that the, the, the people that didn't tend to the guy that was hurt, they were actually didn't tend to him because they were distracted. You ever thought about that? They were so distracted with getting to where they needed to go, so distracted with obeying their ceremonial laws, that they missed the hurting person that was in front of them. In fact, and people could do this, you could be so concerned about ministry and serving that you can miss the people behind it. Distracted. And it's funny that over and against this context, Jesus or Luke tells us this next story in Jesus' life. Now, Jesus was going to wind up at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And when you read the actual story, Martha was sort of the kingpin, if you will, of the house. She, she was the hostess. She ruled the roost there. They probably all lived together. Lazarus was probably a, a semi-wealthy guy. So it's very interesting when you think of that context. Now, often when Jesus would come off of a ministry, come off of a teaching, he would go out into the wilderness. He would go someplace else to rest. And often one of the places that he went was to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, a place where he could sit down and go, nobody's coming at me here. I can, this is kind of a, a safe place for me to relax. Not that he wasn't himself, but just it was a place for him to go away, to recharge, and it was like a second home for him. So we're going to pick up the story because as you see this, it's interesting to note how this happens and what happens next with it. Let's uh, let me, let me get to the story here in Luke chapter 10. Notice what happens. It says, verse 38, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha... Now notice what it says. The woman named Martha welcomed him and probably the disciples that were with him, and we don't know how many, into her home. So it, the idea here is, is that they stopped by the house, and it's kind of like they didn't have a ring doorbell like a lot of us have, you know, where you can, I can see who's at my house right now, you know, knocking on the door. 
I could almost see Jesus coming with his disciples and knocking on the door, and Martha, and Martha goes, Jesus, welcome. And then she's like, oh my gosh, I don't have any food. You ever had that happen? People stop by, you're like, oh. You know, and it, back when I was growing up with, at my house, that was like anathema, man. You had to have food. because that, that was back when people just stopped by your house. You ever notice now? Somebody stops by your house, you're like, what are you, what are you doing here? When are you coming by? You didn't call me. You didn't do nothing. You know, I don't I want, you know, come by and visit. But back when I was a kid, people just knock on the door. Some of them walk in, you know. And so I could imagine them knocking on the door, and Martha's like, Jesus! And she's thinking, oh, gosh, I can't, I don't have any food. What am I? And we don't know how many people were there. But it says, she, being the hospital one, the hospitable one, and the hostess welcomed him into the home. So we don't know, again, how many disciples or anything else were there. Notice what happens. She welcomes him. Mary sees him, and she sits at the Lord's feet just listening to him. So she notices Jesus, and Mary's like, oh, cool, let's talk to Jesus, let's listen to what he's got to say. So she's giving her full, undivided attention to Jesus. So Martha leaves, Mary sits down, starts listening to Jesus, maybe she's asking him questions, maybe other people are asking him questions. They're all talking, probably laughing, having a good time, and Martha is deciding she's going to prepare a meal. Now, here's what's interesting. Verse 40, here's what Dr. Luke says. New Living Translation. But Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Mary was in there visiting with Jesus. Martha had welcomed him. Mary's spending time with Jesus. But it says, but Martha was distracted. Now notice how Luke says this. By the big dinner she was preparing. Now let's just stop there. Dr. Luke is always chooses his words carefully. She was distracted by the big dinner, or you could say by the dinner that she was over preparing. Martha decides she's going to put on a show. Martha decides if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do I'm going to do go above and beyond the call of duty. I am going to put on a spread. So Martha makes this decision on her own, and so she's in there clamoring, trying to get all the stuff. Blah, blah, blah. She's busy, it, Mary, and Mary, her sister's out there going, well, Jesus, what about when you guys did this? What? And they're out there talking. And the more Martha's working, because she's made this decision to do this big dinner, she sees Mary out there, and Mary's not doing what Mary's supposed to be doing. And the more that Mary is not doing what Martha's doing, Martha's getting more and more ticked off about this. And surely, Mary should get sucked into this whirlwind because if you notice, Luke says she was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. In other words, you could read it here that a little dinner would have sufficed. They could have had some hummus and pita and Jesus would have been fine because he just wanted to come by and relax a little bit. But nope, she's going to fix this massive meal. And now she's ticked. Notice what she does. She came to Jesus after she's the one that's distracted. She comes to Jesus and she said, Lord, I love the way. Listen, listen to the language. Doesn't it seem unfair? You ever like when somebody asks a question like that? As soon as the question starts, you know what's coming. Doesn't it seem unfair? Well, when you ask it like that, yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with that. Doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I am doing all the work? She knows for sure that Jesus is, Jesus is not lazy. He's not into laziness. And for sure... Jesus is going to tell her, and she's going to be rewarded, and Martha's going to be, be in the right because she is performing. She is doing this to perfection. She is going all out, and surely Jesus is going to reward that, and he is going to criticize Mary for it. And then we have the big whoops because she says, you tell her to help me. Sounds reasonable, right? But... The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you, now watch this, you are now worried and upset 
over all of these details. You went from taking something that was, should have been simple, and now you've created this massive thing, and now, because of you've been distracted with all of this preparation, now you're even more worried, and you're more upset. Have you ever noticed that? That when you get distracted by something, and all of a sudden you realize you didn't need to do all of that, that you get more worried and more upset about what's not being done and who's not doing this and who's not being that, doing that and why this one has. That's what she's doing. And Jesus says, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Now listen to this. Listen to Jesus' words. There is only one thing, one thing, worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Ouch. In a culture where we reward performance, in a culture where we think busyness and hurriedness and, and people running from one thing to the other and always, always just getting in by the skin of their teeth, that that is to be rewarded, that's to be honored. And, and she thinks that that's exactly what Jesus is gonna do. And he goes, Martha, you actually have it all wrong. Your distraction has caused you to be off focus. Distraction does that to us. We get distracted by the next new shiny thing, the next new program, the next book, the next this, the next that, the next seminar, the next preacher, the next whatever, and the next thing you know, we are following that and then something happens and we go, gee, and we're so far down the road. Then we get more worried and more upset by what we didn't do. And if I had only done this and I hadn't done that, and the next thing you know, we are so stirred up and worried that we can't even think clearly anymore. And Jesus said, Martha, Mary got it right. She sat and she listened and she focused on me. I didn't need the big dinner. I didn't need you doing all of this stuff and now you're mad at her and everybody's stirred up. But she's chosen the right thing and it will not be taken from her. I want you to see what Jesus said. He said, she has chosen. Distraction is a choice. I don't know why we make the choices to be distracted that we make. Sometimes we procrastinate. Sometimes we reach through the phone. It gives us the dopamine hit. And the next thing you know, we're on Instagram reels or we're, we're looking at Twitter. I'm, I'm on Twitter and I see, oh, I can't believe so-and-so said that. Well, how did he reply? Next thing you know, 20 minutes later, I'm involved in an argument that I didn't know I was even involved in or cared about. And it just keeps going and going and going. And then I'm down like, why in the world did I go down that rabbit hole? I think sometimes it's maybe I'm avoiding work, hard work, I'm avoiding hard conversations, I'm avoiding something that needs to be done that's going to be more difficult, so it's easier to take the dopamine hit and keep going. But here's the thing. There are some really important lessons in this, and I'll wrap up here in the next few minutes, of some things that we can do to not be driven by distraction anymore. And there's some interesting lessons. In fact, three choices that I think we could make that are going to help us to kind of be not, ne not necessarily totally delivered from distraction, but at least manage them. And you may be surprised with them. And here it is. Here's number one. We have to choose simplicity over complexity. You're like, what? We got to choose the simple over the complex. Do you know that it is more difficult and it takes more time to simplify the complicated than it does to complicate the simple? It's amazing. It takes more time for us to actually simplify things. I will never forget, I had the opportunity, I had a guy call me one time and he says, uh, he, he was a, a, a New York Times, he had already hit the New York Times list, he went and bought his own publishing company and he said, I want you to help me go, I want you to ghost write a book with me. And I was like, I'll do it, that's cool. We d agreed on terms and all that kind of stuff and he said, I need you to outline the book. So I turned the outline in and he said, okay, let's go with chapter one. So we got to chapter one and I wrote that thing and I, was, and I rewrote it and edited it and rewrote it and edited it and I turned it into him and he writes me back within a matter of like three minutes and says, I'll tell you what, 
uh, when they get the FK score down to 7.5 and then send it back to me. And I was like, really? Now, you don't know what the FK score is. It's the Fleisch Kincaid reading score. It's usually in Microsoft Word. You have to enable it. But what it does is it tells you what the readability of your document is at what level. So as soon as you scan it all, it'll tell you this is at the 10th grade level or whatever. So I got it, and I had written it at the 10th grade level, and he says it has to be at 7.5, which is the 7th grade level, 5th month. You say, well, that's kind of stupid. Why would somebody want to read it that? Do you know that if you will now take an article anywhere and you cut it and paste it into Word, you'll find out that it's at 7.5 or lower? The New International Version of the Bible that we have in here in, in, in here was translated at the seventh grade level. They didn't use any big words. Everything is written at that level because it, and it took me so long. It took me hours to get this thing down to the seventh grade level. I went through every line, through every paragraph, and had to, had to figure it out and turn it in. And what really bummed me is after about four chapters in, the guy got uninterested in the book and he goes, all right, well, we're done with the project. I mean, that was it. But it was a great lesson for me to learn that simplifying the complicated is what I'm supposed to do. I could come in here and say, let's talk, to, to, this morning we're going to talk about the intrinsic eternal perfections of God. And next week we're going to talk about Calvinism as it relates to Arminianism and the theology of the degrees of God and the degrees of separation and the degrees of God's decrees. And you'll go, I got to go to the store. I got to shave my head with a cheese grater. I got to chew on tinfoil. You're not coming back. Because you, you don't want this to be hard. You want to learn something that you can take and go with you. So always choose the simplest path. That's what Jesus did. Simple doesn't mean easy. It means the most straightforward thing. You know what? Because when you do that, you're giving yourself less room to get distracted. Do what's called for. And before you do any more, make sure that you know more is called for. That's how Martha missed it. She could have got some hummus, some dip, say, sorry, guys, this is all I got. Put it on the table. Let's all sit and talk. Then she got mad at everybody else. So we have to, we have to choose simplicity over complexity. Number two, we have to tailor our temperament. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I do, I do a, lot of, a lot of work with behavioral styles. I actually have assessments that I give to people, and I've used them for probably 20-something years. And it's, it's interesting because people are always surprised by these when they, when they see them. They're like, I, I didn't know I did that. Most likely it's something your spouse or somebody else has told you that you're doing, and all of a sudden you read it in black and white, and you go, oh, there it is. The point is, is that all of us have, a, have certain strengths and weaknesses. Mine is communication. I could over-communicate. I could, I could take, make, take a story and make it as long as it needs to be. And I've had to learn to what I like to call land the plane. Because if not, we'll just keep going and going, and I could keep adding more. And if you laugh, forget it. The story's going on longer, you know? So, but my strength overused can become my greatest weakness. Your strength overused can become your greatest weakness. Martha's greatest strength was she knew how to get things done, but then she barreled forward. Mary's greatest strength probably was that she would sit around in contemplation, but if she sat around in contemplation too much, guess what happens? Nothing ever gets done. But in each situation, we have a choice to be able to read the room and to know exactly what it is that we need to be doing. We have to see where we're at and what it's called for at the moment. And that means we've got to choose to tailor our temperament. The third thing, the third choice, is what I'm going to call, we have to choose the one thing. Multitasking is a myth. I said it again, said it before, I'm going to say it again. I, you're, you are not the only one. If you say, no, no, I can multitask, you're not the only one on the planet. You may think you can multitask, but we lose our focus and our control very, very quickly. Mary saw Jesus come in the door. Jesus was her focus at that moment. So what does she do? Forget what's going on in the kitchen. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to focus on this one thing that's most important. God has a one thing for you. He has a one mission. That doesn't mean that it's not going to be just one thing for you to do the rest of your life and you don't have to work. But what's the one thing that he's called you to do? Focus on that. Put everything through that filter. And guess what? 
What you have to do when you're choosing the one thing, that means you're going to learn to say no to a lot of things. When you put it through the filter, boom. Put it through the filter. If it doesn't fit, then let it go. Mary chose the one thing. And Jesus said this to Martha. It's not going to be taken away from her. Why? Because she's focused, she's moving ahead, and she knows what's important. Let me tell you, this is a hard, hard thing on distraction because it happens to all of us. I find myself, when it's done, I'm like, I've, I've been sitting there scrolling, and the next thing you know, it's 20, 30, 40 minutes, I'm ashamed to say. Watching people argue on Facebook or argue on Twitter or talk about this or talk about that. And I'm thinking, man, this stuff works. This dopamine hit's really cool. But meanwhile, I got off mission and got off target. Don't let distract, don't be driven by distraction, but be driven by the destiny, the thing that God has called you to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Sometimes these things are so difficult to comprehend, but we, we wind up taking so much of the distractions and it just adds to our baggage. God, may we not be driven by distraction, but rather be driven by the destiny that you've called us to. May we be able to identify that and continue to focus on that. And God, help us to make these choices to, to at least to, to minimize these distractions in our lives. May we choose that simplicity over complexity. May we, may we really learn to tailor our temperament, knowing that you've given us strengths that we can truly be used in every situation. And God, may we choose that destiny, that one thing that you have for us. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Dismissed. Make it a great week.